I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ballara, and it's uh, nice to have you here and listening to our webinar here on the Lark Veterinary Impact Fund. Thank you for joining. Um, today, we're going to be talking about our new fund that we formed very recently. It just went live. Um, just starting off here with sort of a couple of pictures of our, our ongoing projects. Uh, obviously, this will be have a, a strong real estate focus. So a couple of, uh, couple of pictures here just to open things up. Um, in this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about Lark Capital, the company. Uh, we'll talk about why we decided to, uh, to do a fund and why we decided to do that right now. We'll talk about our investing philosophy, our team. Uh, we'll give an overview with some, suspe some specifics on the fund itself. And um, we'll go to, into some of our points on our investment strategies and the current economy. And then we'll talk about a little bit of a case study. Now, who is Lark Capital? Uh, as I said, I'm Jason Ballara. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lark Capital. Currently within Lark Capital, we have acquired 337 units of multifamily. Uh, we've acquired over 450 plus units of self-storage. Uh, we have 80 plus million dollars of assets under management. And that's that's over the last three years. So that's that's within our own por personal portfolio. I'm proud of it. Um, it's been, been an exciting time. It's been exciting growth. Um, but uh, again, I, I think that's that's not really what makes us special. I think it's a an important component. But as you can see, what we're doing within this fund, um, or what that we'll talk about, is we have formed some strategic partnerships. Um, and you can see from these numbers here, our partners and and, and there's two uh, have over 4,500 units of multifamily and 750 plus million dollars of assets under management. So. Um, in terms of experience, uh, we've we've connected with the right people. So why a fund? Why did we decide to do this now? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's for diversification. So diversification of the portfolio. Within this fund, we will have three components. There will be certainly real estate. Real estate meaning multifamily deals that are our own deals. We're also going to be adding some small businesses to this fund, and, and I'll talk about why in more detail, but um, in a nutshell, because they cash flow tremendously well. We will also have a fund to fund component in there, which is based on the idea of a fund to fund is that we can actually take our uh, the capital that we raise and invest in other people's deals. And that's why uh, I talk so much about the strategic partnerships. What this fund will do for us and our investors is provide opportunities. Um, current market conditions, I'm sure people have heard you know, in the news what's going on. There's a lot of in talks about interest rates and will there be a crash? Are we in a recession? The, the reality is that we're in real estate for a long-term investment. And so you know, what is happening exactly today, it matters in terms of our strategy, but it doesn't change the fact that we believe uh, real estate is an incredibly strong asset class. And so um, what I'm talking about with market conditions, really, I think some of the fear and maybe some of the um, positions that some investors have gotten themselves into over the last couple of years will create uh, the potential for favorable opportunities, maybe some distressed, um, distressed sellers. Um, strategic partnerships, I think, are hugely important. Um, I have often been very reluctant to do any sort of fund-to-fund -fund type of investing because I wasn't willing to invest, um, you know, to bring my investors to someone's deal who I didn't trust 100%. Um, and so... The reason, a big part of the reason why this fund came up is because I was uh, encouraged by one of my mentors and I told her, 
exactly that, that I wouldn't be comfortable um, investing in other people's deals that I wasn't necessarily operating unless I trusted them 100%. I then proceeded to tell her that she was one of those people. Is she open to that? And she said yes. So um, that's like I said. There's there's a very small list of people that I'm I'm willing to you know sort of take this uh, fund and and go invest in their deals. Um, another thing that's great about having a fund is the being prepared. Basically, if you have sort of raised the capital in advance when you are at the table trying to close a deal or trying to get a deal under contract, you have if you can say, hey, look, I've already got the equity raised for this, um, your strength of offer goes up, even if your price isn't the highest, even if your offering price isn't the highest. So at this point, um, sellers are very much interested in the ability to close and having a fund puts us in that position to take advantage of some of these opportunities that, that may be coming. Um, in terms of demographics, what I mean by that, this is in relation to the businesses. Um, small businesses, there are over 12 million uh, for sale currently in the US, um, and eight out of 10 small businesses that go for sale are never sold. The demographics associated with this and why this is only going to get go more in our favor is because the baby boomer generation is reaching retirement age, and so a lot of them are basically at the point where they're ready to sell their businesses, and so the opportunities to purchase and pick up some of these existing businesses from baby boomers is, are only going to grow. Um, perhaps most importantly to me about this fund is the impact that we're going to have. We're gonna talk more about this, but um, ultimately I'll be donating a portion of the proceeds from the fund, a portion of the fund profits to Not One More Vet, which is an organization dedicated to the mental health and prevention of suicide within the veterinary industry, which uh, at least those of us in the industry are probably pretty aware that that's a, that's a staggeringly high statistic. We have one of the highest suicide rates of any, um, any profession. So what makes our fund unique? I touched on some of this already, um, but there, I'll, I'll run through it again quickly. The structure is, as I said, there's three components. There's real estate, our own direct deals, there is fund to fund models, so investing in other um, strategic partners, real estate deals, and then there's the uh, small business portion of it. Um, I quite honestly did not find anyone else doing it this way, um, and it was so unique uh, that I actually had to have a uh, custom underwriting model built to be able to sort of model all of this out. So um, I thought about what I wanted to do and then sort of had to reverse engineer the way to do it. Uh, diversification within the fund, you're going to have be automatically diversified because you'll be within multiple real estate deals as well as small businesses. So you get sort of that one-stop shop for diversification. And then when we say outsized returns, the reason why I added small businesses to this fund is because it's what I was going to do for myself, for my own personal portfolio, because real estate at this point is it's a little bit more challenging to have strong cash flow from within these assets. And so what we're doing is by marrying the businesses, which provide large amounts of cash flow to the business, uh, or sorry, to the real estate appreciation and tax benefits, really, really going to be able to um, kind of juice the returns. And I'll, I'll talk more about that and, and put some numbers behind it later in the slideshow. And then again, um, we are not the only impact-driven fund, but um, certainly I feel like that's an extremely important and um, relatively unique component to this fund. There's lots of funds out there that you could invest in uh, that are um, do not have any you know, sort of charitable component. Okay, so why do we think these are strong assets? Um, the fundamentals haven't changed. Uh, one of the probably most important things uh, in terms of fundamentals and why I, uh, it's basically on here twice, is the supply and demand. So we are short uh, millions of housing units in the US. And so the reason, probably one of the big reasons why we haven't had a real estate crash um, while the interest rates have gone up is because the demand is still extremely high for real estate. Uh, people need places to live. And so uh, the demand for a place to rent is incredibly strong still. 
Um, real estate is, is always considered an inflation hedge. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about inflation over the last year. Um, ultimately, being invested in hard assets uh, are going to help you protect against that inflation versus having your money just sitting in a savings account where the value of the dollar, dollar continues to decrease. As I said, the small businesses here really, really equal cash flow. It's sort of tremendously eye-opening once you get to see the possibilities there. And what we think is going to happen, and we're already seeing some of this, I'm, I'm honestly not sure it's going to be as as big of a pricing reset as some of the um, naysayers might be saying, but I, I think there's going to be a, I think a meeting in the middle. Um, a year ago, we were in an extremely hot market. Uh, things were potentially somewhat overpriced, you could say. Um, I don't think, you know, we're, some, some people think we're going back to 2008. It, it, it's going to be likely somewhere more in the middle. I'm not a, <laughs> I have no crystal ball. Uh, I'm certainly not an economist, but seeing what's going on in the market, it seems to be that uh, people paused for a while, but um, deal flow and uh, activity and transactions are starting to pick up again. So I think uh, we're sort of, sort of starting to reach that maybe leveling out point. So our philosophy, we really provide, we pride ourselves in putting our investors first uh, before profit, before fame or prestige. Um, as many of you probably know, family is the foundation of LARC Capital. Um, LARC is, is in theory an acronym. So it's Logan, Ava, Reed, and Casey, uh, which uh, Logan and Ava are my children. Casey's my wife and Reed is my business partner. So uh, this was was always uh, not just my business partner, one of my best friends. So this, this was always a, a sort of a family endeavor. I, I honestly don't look at any of this as to how it affects me. It, it, it's all about what kind of comes, comes after me. So um, we take that philosophy and we believe we we uh, will we believe in applying it to our investors as well. Uh, we understand and appreciate the trust that uh, the investors we've had so far have given uh, in in partnering with us on our deals and and really being a part of of the Lark family. And I've always really believed in impact as being a top priority um, with this uh, fund we are really able to bring that to the forefront. Um, ultimately, my my goal, my my big uh, aspiration is to someday have a, a charitable component called the Not One or uh, the Know Your Why Foundation. Um, and so I think that this veterinary impact fund really, really starts us off, really heads us in that right, in that in the right direction. So this is our team. Uh, it, it's a small team <laughs> thus far. Um, we've tried to keep it lean on purpose. I'm the co-founder and CEO. I mentioned Reed. He is uh, also co-founder and I should say CFO. Um, I put a little typo in there. And then Song uh, is my assistant and she's uh, been really, really instrumental to the growth of Lark Capital here over the last um, year plus. And it really couldn't do it without her and and you know sort of keeping along that veterinary theme um reed is a veterinary cardi double boarded veterinary cardiologist and and criticalist and song was a doctor's assistant here in in la until she moved off to atlanta so we all have veterinary background uh, and that's why this is so important to us so a bit of the overview on the fund we're really going to talk about here you know kind of the 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 numbers the highlights if you will um so the fund size will be 10 million dollars of total equity the anticipated life of the fund is 5 to 7 years um and then the target holdings will be mainly B class multifamily greater than 100 units and then also well established cash flowing small businesses Within the fund, the equity is going to be um, allocated very specifically, and and full disclosure, I didn't make this up. This is what the SEC tells us we have to do. So, within the fund, eighty plus percent of the fund will be uh, allocated towards multifamily real estate. Up to twenty five percent of that of of the fund can be used as fund to fund, so investing in other people's deals, and then we can go up to 20% investing in small businesses. So the strategy will be to maximize opportunities and strategically improve the cash flow by layering those businesses on top of the real estate. 
Um, this is an investing opportunity for, unfortunately, it has to be accredited investors only. Um, if you are not accredited and you hear this and you're interested in investing, uh, we still will have other opportunities for non-accredited investors. I also can help you figure out if you are or are not accredited and what steps you could take to get there. Uh, we are welcoming retirement account investments, so you can invest in real estate from a um, uh, you can use your 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 old 401k or old IRAs to invest in within retirement accounts. And if you have questions about that, again, please feel to re free to reach out. The minimum minimum investment will be fifty thousand, and the distribution frequency will be monthly. There are three investment classes uh, within this fund, and they are fairly similar. Um, however, they're, they're based on sort of investment amount. So if you invest between 50,000 and 250,000, basically you are going to be, um, you're going to go get a 10% preferred return, which is, if you don't know what a preferred return is, that means that you as the investor, until you reach a 10% return on your investment, uh, us as the fund administrators do not receive any profit. After that 10%, now it becomes a 70-30 split, 70% 70 in favor of the investors. And after 14% in class A, then that split goes from 50 goes to 50-50. The reason is basically 14%, especially today in, in today's market, is quite good, but you do continue to um gain profits beyond that. Um, and again, I don't have to read the whole chart to you, but you can kind of see it's all based on the um, amount invested. Everybody gets the same preferred return. Everybody gets the same 70, 30% split up to 14% IRR. And then the only thing that changes is that sort of split above 14% IRR. Now, what we are doing, and I, and I think this uh, is um, sort of a win for, for everybody, really, um, the first 2 million that comes into the fund, so the first 2 million of the 10 million that is invested in the fund will be considered class C regardless of investment amount. So you can come in with $50,000 and you will still um, maintain that 70-30 split regardless of the returns. So um, it's a nice incentive incentive to, to get into the fund early. The other incentive about getting into the fund early is we, we already have deals lined up. So um, the earlier you are, the better your returns will be. So just to give you a couple of samples, um, this is just uh, you know sort of a, an example multifamily pro forma. Uh, this is actually the pro forma from the first deal that's going to be a part of the fund. Um, there is a picture here, uh, essentially goes over the capital stack, which essentially explains um, where sort of profits go and in what order. So uh, the bank always gets paid first. So they're down at the bottom. Uh, preferred equity in some deals uh, that we have is essentially like a second loan. And then after that becomes you as the passive investor. And then finally, the general partners or the operators, that's us. That's when we would get our profit. So we are we are last uh, in the capital stack. And, and that's certainly on purpose to make sure that the investors get taken care of first. Here's a, a sample small business pro forma. Um, this is actually, this is an actual deal that uh, I'm looking at trying to get um, under contract. And so uh, here we have, you know, kind of, don't don't try to read through all of this P&L right now, but basically if you look at the bottom um, and you sort of calculate out the average monthly cash flow before debt service or the, or the mortgage, however you want to call it, in the previous year was over $47,000 per month. Uh, the monthly debt service at the current rates would be about $28,000. Um, one of the really nice things, we'll talk more about this, is the leverage you can get on small businesses. And then so that leaves the remaining cash flow on the month of uh, $19,000 plus. Um, and again, this is, this is being pretty conservative, but that was in the year prior. So um, assuming that revenues increase, that, that uh, monthly cash flow will actually go up. So on this slide, what I did is I tried to show you the best I could is, is the way that 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 this works and the way that it's sort of the way that or the reason why the small businesses really um, sort of elevate the returns. So up top, you can see um, projected returns on a $500,000 investment within a real estate deal. And this is 
pretty typical for what you're going to see about now. Um, I'm not going to run through all of the numbers. Um, I'll point out some of the important ones here. But basically, you know, as you're as an investor throughout the life of the hold, you're going to get cash distributions each year, and then you're going to get, you know, sort of your chunk of money at the sale based on whatever your shareholder uh, or your shares are in that deal. So at the end of the day, in this particular example, the equity multiple is 1.88. So that's 1.88 times your um, investment is your, your total return. And then your average annual return on that is over 17%, which is uh, $88,000 plus. If we take the small business and we layer on those cash flows. So the way I came to this number, there's a couple of assumptions here. But if we say that this person who invested $500,000 has, um, and within our fund, $2 million of the fund is allocated to small businesses, the invested amount is 5%. That person has 5% of the total equity in the fund. So this just under $65,000 is 5% of um, the total cash flow from the assumed cash flow from small businesses. So then we're adding this together. So we're looking at the, you know, sort of the yearly return lines um, up top. And what I did to be conservative is I didn't change it. So the assumption in, in business is you're really trying to push revenues at least 10% each year. I didn't change those numbers. I just looked at, okay, if everything stayed the same and we layer on that cash flow, what's going to happen here? And so you can see down the bottom, we have the blended annual cash flow and what that works out to from a, you know, sort of annual yearly return. And then we add in the sale, the sale proceeds from the real estate. You'll notice what I didn't do is I didn't add in the sale of the business. So again, I'm trying to be extremely conservative here, but that will only make the returns even better. There's a lot of things we can do to sort of uh, increase the value of a and sell the business. But but ultimately, if you just look at this from a cash flow play, now we're increasing our total equity multiple from 1.88 to 2.53. Your total average annual return goes from 17 to 30 percent, and so. In terms of actual cash, you're taking home, uh, averaging out instead of 88,000 a year, 152,000 a year. So it's it's a very sort of simplified way to look at it. But by being super conservative with these numbers, we can kind of see how that looks from a, from a pure, um, you know, sort of pure return standpoint. So some of this is going to be be repetitive. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but um, you know, some of the benefits being in our being within our fund uh, is, you know, we we certainly always put the investors first. Um, to be quite honest, sometimes I've done it to my own detriment, but but I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> you, we will always have an aligned interest. Uh, I invest in every single deal, so uh, if if you're in it, I'm in it. Uh, I'll never, I'll never bring anyone a deal that I wouldn't invest in. So um, you'll see uh, that 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 will be true. I'll be invested right alongside you, and 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 may very well be one of the biggest investors in each of the deals. Uh, we're going to minimize our risk through diversification. So this fund, um, like I said, allows us to diversify inherently within it. And we're going to diversify across assets, across markets, and. And um, like I said, we're going to have businesses and real estate, which which provides quite a bit of valuable diversity there. Um, we're always looking at this from a capital preservation standpoint. So the first thing is get you your money back. The next thing is grow it. So we'll always approach our business plans with that in mind. Um, tax benefits. Everybody talks about the tax benefits of real estate. And um, to be completely honest, it it varies whether you're uh, what they call a real estate professional or whether you have a regular W-2 job. However, it, it varies on how you get to use them. You will always get to benefit from them. It's just a matter of sort of when. Um, I'm not a CPA. Certainly, if you're involved in something like this, you want to um, connect yourself with a real estate CPA, and I can always help with that with recommendations. Um, and conservative underwriting. Like I said, you know, on, on the previous slide, we we really looked at this as we had these businesses, what's it going to do to cash flow? And we didn't even try to layer on, you know, kind of the sale proceeds from those businesses. Uh, 
All right, so our investment strategy, again, some of this is repetitive. I'm not going to read this to you, but essentially what we're doing is we're looking at assets that we can maximize asset appreciation. So we're looking at multifamily properties where the leases are below market rent. We're looking for um, outdated multifamily properties with deferred maintenance, things that we can essentially go in and force appreciation. Um, in terms of management, they may be poorly managed, so their expenses are high, and they may not be able to, uh, or we may be able to reduce those operational costs to help increase NOI. And then again, as I mentioned, the market conditions hopefully will open us up to maybe picking up some distressed assets and, and being really um, opportunistic there. And then again, the cash flowing businesses, it's really important to understand you know, kind of when I say that, right, there's there's millions of different of types of businesses. We're truly looking for in-place businesses with a history of cash flowing, looking at low overhead. So there's there's businesses that I like, but may not necessarily be low overhead that we're, we're not going to put these in the fund. So there are different, um, you know, sort of priorities when, when managing this for investors. I'm not trying to find uh, fun investments. I'm trying to look for, you know, honestly, boring, uh, boring investments with with really um, great returns. So when we're looking at a multifamily market, we're looking at a couple things, you know, some of these are obvious, it's what everybody talks about, we're looking at strong locations, we're looking at population growth, we're looking at an employment growth, and we're looking for um, high barriers to entry with high earning industry segments. So there's a couple of things that make, um, you know, a market very strong. Uh, I have been largely focused on Atlanta uh, for a couple of reasons. I think uh, I wanted to be, you know, sort of a, a an expert, have a, have a phenomenal um, team there, boots on the ground. Um, but I also really love the market for a couple of reasons. A um, couple of them, one, uh, Atlanta is always on the the list of top cities in terms of growth, um, uh, industries coming into the city, that sort of thing. But they're not usually like number one through three, so they're not not a boom or bust city. They're pretty steady growth, and I like that. I, I don't want something that I, is going to shoot up and then potentially you know drop back down uh, once that you know the excitement over that new market goes away. Um, the other thing is a lot of real estate investors are running into some trouble in um, Florida and Texas due to insurance costs that have gone up tremendously high. Um, that's generally due to natural disasters, and we don't see a lot of natural disasters in Atlanta, knock on wood. So it, we haven't been hit with the same um, increases there. So there's there's some really strong reasons why I like um, Atlanta, and I, and I think Personally, I think it's going to grow a lot over the next um, three to five years. I it's not the only market we'll look at, but um, it's really been been a favorite of mine thus far. As far as our acquisition criteria in multifamily, we're looking at 100 plus units. We're certainly looking for a value add component, whether that is through construction or management. Um, we're looking for outsized return portfolios. So um, we want to know that we can force for appreciation there. We're looking for class A and B multifamily, mainly B. Uh, it's it's going to be easier to force appreciation in those. And we're looking for underperforming, currently as, underperforming assets that we can uh, turn them around and make them excel. So we have a certainly a risk, risk mitigation strategy. Uh, we look very closely at our operational efficiency. Uh, the last year, uh, really, we have spent very, very closely monitoring and kind of um, dialing in the operational the, the operational side of asset management. Um, as I said, we've built in Atlanta a really strong team uh, on, on the construction side. We've got a great construction manager. Uh, we've got a number of really good contractors that we can work with and um, we're we're trying to dial that in more and more, and as we grow locally, uh, we can get efficiencies of scale through our costs on materials. So there's a lot of a lot of good going on there. Um, in terms of acquisitions, we underwrite conservatively. Everybody says that they underwrite conservatively. Um, I sort of showed you, you know, kind of what we're we're looking at, but but uh, what's changed over the last year 
is you know kind of seeing what's going on in the market you it's going to be harder to get debt and so if you're not they're going to be underwriting con conservatively even more conservatively so it's it's going to be a joint effort it's going to be be um you're gonna to have to be really spot on to get you know get the lenders as as they are the biggest uh investor in the deal to get the lenders on board with the deal so we'll, we'll be very very closely monitoring our our underwriting as i said i had a custom model created um, and then from a financing standpoint, we're really looking at fixed rate agency debt for new acquisitions. Uh, and that may come as uh, new debt or it may come as um, a loan assumption, which is actually a really nice thing. You know, a lot of people have um, some pretty low interest rates that closed deals over the last number of years. And so if you're able to acquire or assume one of those loans at a low interest rate, it's a, it's a huge advantage in terms of um, operational costs. So the advantages with us, again, some of this is repetitive, but, but I'm really excited about our strategic partnerships. Um, you know, the, the people that we're gonna be working with have tremendous amount of experience in, in creating a, a very, very, um, highly efficient and um, just high performance business. Uh, we have a track record, uh, strong track record in both real estate and business, both myself and uh, and our partners. And then, um, as I said, this fund is impact driven. Um, the the idea behind this, I don't think I would have done this fund if I hadn't been able to come with come with some sort of some impact to it. Um, but we will be donating, like I said, a portion of the profits to not one more vet. Um, the idea is, is that, you know, and, and I'll be looking to raise a lot of awareness about the struggles in the veterinary community right now. I'm not going to go, <laughs> we, we could talk for hours about that alone, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, but the idea is, you know, you know, in a nutshell, um, veterinarians have one of the highest suicide rates of all industries. Female veterinarians are three and a half times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. Um, some some real staggering numbers. And uh, not one more vet is a, is an organization dedicated to helping people with melting mental health problems, helping people, you know, sort of navigate those stresses and challenges, and and overall trying to reduce the suicide rates within our profession. Um, and I, I, I've always been, you know, I'm a veterinary surgeon. I, I've always thought to myself, like, I just, I just got to help as many pets as I can, help as many pets as I can, help as many people as I can. But what I realized is the way I can actually help more pets and pet owners is by helping more vets. So it's a little, little silly slogan, but help more vets, help more pets, because it is ultimately like a numbers game. And so if our, if the veterinarians uh, stop leaving the profession and the staff stop le leaving the profession because we've supported them and created, um, you know, a, a better environment for, to be in the field, then, then ultimately that's, that's going to help pet owners and their pets. Transparency. Um, you can always reach out to me as an investor, call me. I, I actually sometimes wish that the investors would call me or text me more. I see a lot of them frequently, uh, my current investors, but yeah, it's uh, always feel free to um, reach out. We will, uh, we send monthly um, uh, reports on each property. We have a newsletter. We try to be as informative as possible, but please, if you ever have questions, about this fund, about if you invest in a deal, anything, always just reach out directly to me. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it and tell you what's going on. Um, and in our team, really, we we are building large capital from a culture standpoint. So that's a it's a, it's it's a big part of you know maybe some people, maybe some companies grew faster over the last few years than we did, but but I'm okay with that. I ultimately. Um, we will always look at things from a what's best for the investor standpoint, and everybody on my team understands that. Uh, it, it's 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 easy to get caught up in that growth, but but we need to do it right. We need to make sure we're making making the right uh, decisions and making the right differences in in our investors' lives. So why do you want to invest in this stuff now? Uh, a lot of people are very afraid, given you know what you're hearing uh, on the news, but. Um, just in terms of history, multifamily real estate has outperformed the S&P 500. So um, 
not that that's the only place you can invest, but uh, certainly in terms of performance, multifamily historically always sits at the top. Um, I think, and, and, and it's a, a, I think a less volatile, uh, less risky investment. Um, it's not to say don't invest in other things, but uh, I quite honestly hate the fact that they call investing in real estate, um, alter they call real estate an alternative asset. Uh, I don't think it's alternative when everybody lives in real estate. So it's it's kind of a silly name for it. But but the reality is, is that a lot of people don't know how to get involved. And so, you know, you know that's that's another thing that we're trying to do is, is bring awareness to that possibility. Uh, S&P 500, don't believe everything you hear about, you know, sort of that being a diversified place to invest. Um, S&P 500 has 500 companies, as the name implies. But basically, if you took Facebook, Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft, Microsoft Apple, and NVIDIA out of there, there's been a 1% return this year, uh, year to date. So what that really just what that means is that there's... Um, not as much diversity, which in that within that S and P five hundred as you might think. Uh, quite frankly, I have a lot of stock in Nvidia thanks to my dad, <laughs> and uh, so I'm very happy that Nvidia has carried the S and P five hundred up a ton recently. But um, I, I'm not saying don't invest in stocks. I'm just saying you, you need to have more uh, awareness of of what you're actually doing with your money and, and and trying to make you know sort of the best decisions for the long term. So following the last recession of 2008, uh, when things started to recover, multifamily real estate was the place that um, the, you know, sort of ultra wealthy put their money. Um, they felt it was the safest place to place their funds uh, in, you know, as a, as a uh, recession recovery. So just something, again, to say it, it's a, it's a safe, it's a good risk-adjusted return investing in real estate. So why do we like class B assets? And as I said earlier, you know, we'll look at class A and B. There's some reasons why you would do A. A mainly means new construction. So the, if, we, if we can find the right development deal to get into, great. But um, ultimately, what we like about class B assets are these are typically necessity renters. So um, there are people that uh, maybe don't have the option to buy a house at this point. And obviously that's that's hard for people trying to buy a house right now. Um, whereas in class A brand new uh, apartment buildings, typically those are people that just choose to rent. And so your necessity renters are more likely to renew their lease, absorb rent increase, increases, and be happy about the value add improvements that we're doing at their, at their property. Uh, they also can be acquired at a much lower cost basis than you know sort of replacement costs so the cost to build is going to be higher than what we're going to buy these class class b assets at and they should have higher yields um, again because of the uh, sort of one of the things is the cap rate spread the other thing is just the ability to we talk about here the noi growth the ability to force appreciation within these class b assets where if you have a brand new build unless you're getting involved at at the you know inception of the project before it's actually constructed, once once it's leased up, not a whole lot's going to change at that point. You're just looking at sort of a really long long term hold, um, you know, sort of slow increases in value. Um, there's a low impact because class so a low impact from new supply um, on class B because it doesn't directly compete with those class A deliveries. So when there is some, you need to be careful about that. You need to, to notice what the absorption is, but ultimately it's, you, again, you're looking at a different set of renters in a, a brand new build as you might in a class B. The idea is you can probably make a class B look and feel almost as good as a class A and then still charge uh, less. And so you're gonna have a, you know, sort of a higher demand there. And you can see across, across the top 150 markets, class B rents are $472 or 21% less than class A rents. So I talked a lot about this already, why I like small businesses, but, but we're looking here really at um, 
established businesses with in-place operators. So I'm not looking to get myself a bunch of new jobs. The idea is that we will be owners at the fund as, as a group. We, uh, along with the investors, will be owners of these businesses, um, but we will purchase businesses with established in-place operators, which is actually somewhat surprising to me, kind of the norm when you purchase a business. A lot of times the owner will stay around to help the transition. They may already have a, a strong management group in place that will stay on. So you have a lot of really good opportunity to kind of just step in and look at where we can make some um, small tweaks to increase revenue, but otherwise just sort of continue to let the cash flow. Uh, we'll be looking at low overhead businesses. I, I uh, sort of mentioned this before, but basically the um, there are certain business. I love construction. Um, that's kind of my thing. I've been doing it since I was a kid. I love construction, but I, I won't put construction businesses in this because there is a lot of overhead that goes in construction projects. Um, there's a lot of materials, that sort of thing. But for example, there's a picture of a nail salon. Um, funny story. I, I, someone told me about a nail salon deal and I literally laughed out loud. Why would I buy a nail salon? I would buy a nail salon now. I would buy many nail salons <laughs> because once you see the cash flow uh, in these in these businesses and the and the low level of um, uh, expenses, uh, it's kind of a no brainer. So uh, very likely to be looking to get some nail salons into this uh, into this fund. Nail salons, um, car washes, storage units. Um, what else? Laundromats. Those are are like kind of the bread and butter of, of this type of um, asset that we're going after. As I said, baby boomer, boomers are, are uh, the biggest business owning demographic and are currently retiring more than ever. So the opportunities are only going to get greater. And the supply, unlike real estate, the supply of businesses is higher than the demand for buying them. So where real estate uh, very recently was very much a seller's market now or sort of maybe evening out, maybe shifting to a buyer's market, we'll see. But when it comes to um, small businesses, it's it's, it's very much a, a uh, buyer's market. So you have a lot of, of wiggle room. Um, another thing is the, the leverage here. So you can buy an established small business with a SBA loan, uh, and they will allow you to finance 90% of the business pro purchase price. So if you want to look at some quick math here, right? If we have $2 million uh, of equity in the fund dedicated to small businesses, we are actually able to buy $20 million worth of businesses uh, within the fund. Contrast that with real estate, where right now leverage is going to be lower. That's a good thing. It's safe. But if we're going to have, if we say the other $8 million goes to real estate, that might get us say $30 million of real estate. So the uh, ability to have a higher level of assets or a higher leveraged asset and then grow the value of that business over time, um, we can do that quite well, you know, adding these businesses to the fund. Here's just a quick case study. Um, this was a deal actually of one of the strategic partners that I was invested in. Um, it was, it, it, you can look at the numbers here. I don't need to go through all of it. It went tremendously well. Um, it was a 19 month exit. Um, a lot of people did that over the last three to five years. A lot, a lot of people did the market helped, uh, certainly. Um, but the, so the, the expectation for turning deals in, in a year and a half, two years and having incredibly high returns isn't likely. Um, it's not likely to happen anymore given the current market. However, that doesn't mean that investing in real estate is bad. It's just not as amazing as it was <laughs> two years ago, three years ago. Um, but I really do think by adding those businesses into this fund, we can achieve virtually uh, very similar um, returns. All right. Well, that is all that I have. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. I guess I, I did notice some people joined. Um, happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything. Um, if not, please, please feel free to reach out. 
uh, we do already have the first deal that will be a part of the fund. So um, it is beneficial on a number of fronts to kind of uh, get into the fund early. Uh, like I said, any, any, anyone within the first $2 million is going to be automatically class C, which is sort of the, the um, potential highest returned class profile. And also, like I said, we already have this deal. So the, the sooner you get in, the, the better your returns will be and uh, be, be really happy to have you um, schedule a call. The disclaimer, uh, basically, I'm not not an attorney, not a CPA. Um, this is these are projections. These are you know kind of based on past performance, but doesn't guarantee um, future similar performance. But we have been, like I said, very very conservative in our um, underwriting and projections, and so I feel feel really good about you know what we're going to do with this fund. I feel really good about the impact side of it. So. Um, Thanks for watching. Uh, Song, I don't know if, if we got any questions or if we have any questions. If not, that's fine. We'll we'll jump off. No, no. no questions. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.